So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I'll be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Good morning, folks. Is that working? Yay. Um, Great to see you here all this morning. Um, The person George referred to as Michelle is me. Um, not my wife, who is also Michelle. Um, it's great to have you with us. Um, if you're new or visiting, uh, we'd love to get to know you. Do come and say hello if that is something you're comfortable with. But it's good to have you. For those of you online, uh, welcome again to Christchurch North Coast. And for those of you outside, um, welcome. Now, um, I don't know if you've been watching the news over the, the last couple of weeks. You would have saw, um, you would have seen that uh, Palestine and Israel are at each other's throats again. Um, I stopped counting at three mass shootings in May in the U.S. I think there were five, but I stopped counting at three. Um, The slaughter of women and children um, in Burkina Faso continued over the last couple of weeks. I don't know if you saw that. And I could open a can there of of the slaughter of women and children around the world. Um, Closer to home, marriages are failing as they always have. Kids are being bullied at school as they always have. Families are fighting with each other as they always have. Conflict in business, conflict between people in business, conflict on the sports field, in pubs, in church, is alive and strong. Now, I could spend 10 minutes, 15 or whatever, proving to you that humanity has always been a long story of conflict. But I'm not going to do that because you actually already know that. You only have to read a little bit of history to see that. And one says, good on humanity. Humanity's put things in place to resolve conflict, United Nations, marriage counselors, human resources departments, psychologists, mediators, and the list goes on. Now, when, when, I begin, when we begin to look at this topic, why can't we just get on? I think to myself, why can't I just run away? I don't know if you feel that way. Because sometimes it is just too overwhelming to think about the realities of our world. I don't know if you feel that way. Some of you have expressed to me how you've stopped reading the news. I do think it's one of the reasons we beach, berg, and braai so much as a culture, because we actually are running from reality. We just want to be happy in a world that isn't. In the 70s, it was said, if you want to find a man in denial of his life, you will find him fiddling in his garage. And, and I, think, I, think, I, think, I think I sympathize with that. And same with, with I think I, I can relate in one sense to John Lennon's Imagine song, even though it's not great. But when he says, it'll come up on the screen, imagine there's no countries, it isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us. 
and the world would be as one. If you've re- done any reading around John Lennon, it's, it's more of a cry than a song. Um, and it cries out, why can't we just get on <laughs> with each other? And folks, welcome to Genesis 4. Um, it is that story. It is the story of where it all began. It's, it's a story of conflict. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for a moment, and then what we're going to do is we're going we're to ask God in the prayer to help us understand why the world is in such conflict. Um, but just in case you are as depressed about it as I am on this topic, um, I'm hoping you will see the sun break through the clouds and lift your hearts a bit as we look at an extremely depressing passage. So I'm going to pray and ask God for help as we look at it. Let's have a look. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you speak to us from your word. We need answers. We need hope. We need you. So come to us and speak to us. Show us what we need to see. Give us answers. Give us hope. Give us you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So folks, if you, if you haven't been around, as George said, um, life outside the Garden uh, of Eden is now marked with conflict. We saw that in Genesis 3. Go get that online. Um, you know, George, it was, it was a great job George did for us there, bringing God's Word to us. Go and get that online. But you would have remembered that the world is now in conflict. We're in conflict with the ground. That is, the world around us produces thorns and thistles. Work is hard. This planet is broken. We're in conflict with God, that is, we remain under His condemnation because of our sin, and we're in conflict with each other. We turn on each other as Adam and Eve did in the garden. You might remember that. And one would ask then, if we get all that in Genesis 3, what's the point of Genesis 4 then? If we've already got that, why do we have Genesis 4? Why is it written if we've got that in Genesis 3? Well, in one sense, it is the same as Genesis 3, but in another sense, it's completely different. So it's the same in the fact that it shows us that the world of Genesis 3, where we have these, this big conflict, ground with God with each other, continues. That's the world we live in. We're going to see that again now in chapter 4. And even the, the structure in the Hebrew, chapter 3 and chapter 4, in the Hebrew, the structure is the same, for those of you interested in that kind of stuff. But it's different as it introduces us to two paths, chapter 4, Genesis, two paths that emerge out of the Garden of Eden, if you like. One path is the way of Cain. The other is the way of Abel. And what Moses does as he writes this down, what he's doing is preparing the Israelites for the land. He wants God's saved people as they enter the land to make a decision. Are you going to follow the way of Cain, who killed his brother and who didn't trust God, or the way of Abel, who trusted God? And in one sense, folks, that is the question that lies before us this morning as we look at this complete disaster of a family. Uh, what path are you going to follow? What path are you following? Cain or Abel? So that's what you want to be thinking of as we go through this. But if you, if you were a student and you were listening to the passage being read, or if you've read it before, you would have noticed that there's, there's not much about Abel. Do you notice that? He doesn't even speak. There's lots about Cain. And so as we look at this, I want to show you three things about the path of Cain. It's a warning as much as it, as it is an explanation of why we have conflict in the world. And then there is the path of Abel, which we'll have a look at um, as we draw it to a close. So a lot about Cain, and then we're going to jump at Abel. You guys ready? Seatbelts on. Get comfortable. Um, you're going to need a seatbelt. Here's the first thing. Uh, it's going to come up on the screen that we see in this passage, the path of Cain is marked by self-righteousness. The path of Cain is marked by self-righteousness. And so as you, if, you, if you look at the text there, um, the, the story begins, it looks like normal life as always outside of the garden. It could be our life. The married couple have sex, we read, and they have a kid. Uh, Eve, like any mom, gets super excited. She's so happy that she names the kid Cain, which means... I have achieved. <laughs> She's a proud mom. Life goes on, and as they do, they have a second kid, and, they, and, and his name is Abel, and we'll learn what that means later. Cain loves gardening, and so Adam sends him off to agricultural college, and he becomes a Cain farmer. You see what I did there? Abel always loved the chickens and the cows, and so he studies and becomes a stock farmer. 
They grew up at Christ Church North Coast, and at church one day, both these boys make an offering to the Lord. Cain comes along with his truck, drops off a pile of vegetables, and Abel, we read, verse 4, brings the first, uh, the fat portions of the firstborn of his flock. And so, in one sense, folks, it's normal life outside the garden. It could be our life. Two brothers, two workers, both churchgoers, ordinary. Then verse 4. Have a look. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. You kind of, you kind of ask yourself like, Jeep was like, what, what, what went down there? <laughs> what happened? You know, did, did, did we miss something? One minute there's two brothers, happy as Larry at church, doing their thing, and the next thing God's like, Cain, I don't accept you. It's quite rough, and you kind of feel for Cain. It's, it's the kind of, hey, I did the dishes as well. Why does, why does Abel get all the praise? And the question, is God anti-veg? We laugh. It's the big question. Why has God no regard for Cain's offering? And there are many people who have tried to speculate on veg versus animal in here because of the sacrifice issue around animals. So they say Cain was the good oak because he was doing the right thing in that sense. But we don't need to speculate. The New Testament actually helps us. And we read this in, in, in 1 John 3, which is helpful. We should not be like Cain who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. See, so Cain's efforts were considered, his sacrifice, the way he did things was considered, considered evil. But why? Well, Hebrews 11 helps us. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Sorry, this might be a little slightly different translation up on the screen. It's not on my screen behind me. And so Abel trusted God when he offered his sacrifice. So that's helpful. So there was Abel trusted God, Cain didn't. Jude, I think, actually nails it for us. Jude 11. I won't give you the context of Jude 11, but woe to them for they, and here it is, they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Koran's rebellion. Balaam and Koran, I'm not going to tell you them about now, you about them now, but they abandoned God by refusing to listen to God, and they both did one thing. They ignored God, and they did their own thing. They were what we call self-righteous. Self-righteous means to think you know better than anyone else. It's to consider yourself the center of your own existence. You are the center and the planets revolve around you instead of around God. That was Cain. See, folks, what is happening here with this, the two kids at church offering their different things and Cain's rejected is Cain was only going through the motions. He had abandoned God in his heart. He didn't trust God like Abel. It's fascinating, and, and I don't want us to miss this. It's like when you reluctantly pay the tax man. You know, you're not interested in the tax man, but you pay the tax man to get him off your back. Now, that might not be the best example. I don't want to downplay if you're a tax person here, but you get the point. That's Cain. He comes to church and jumps through the religious hoops, but his heart is not for God. He wants to do life his own way, and so he pays his dues only to get God off his back. Abel, we'll look at him a bit more later, but on the other hand, Abel's not like that. He brought the fat portions of his firstborn. That is very telling. Uh, the, the firstborn and the fat, you would have to kill the animal to give that, um, is your breeding stock. Uh, one, and there's a lot more to it in the, in the Hebrew culture, but Ray Orland, a, a theological writer, says this, which I think is very helpful. He says, in other words, Cain threw a tip on the table, but Abel gave his best. Cain gave out of his income, but Abel, Abel gave out of his capital. Cain made a gesture of thanks, but Abel risked his future growth potential by giving God some of his breeding stock. The difference between the two boys, or men, was tokenism versus love, and God took it seriously. See, folks, the way of Cain is the way of self. It's self-righteousness. His heart was not for God. It's funny, when you, when you read the New Testament on this, uh, and, and go and do this as an exercise, you will notice that self-righteousness is a topic that Jesus keeps speaking to. Almost all of the parables, all of His illustrations are directed 
tilted at self-righteousness. And when he's talking to the Pharisees, he says this, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Folks, many people, even in Belito, possibly some of us sitting here today, are on the path of Cain. We honor God with our lips, but our hearts are far from God. We are self-righteous, and God does not accept the self-righteous. Now, we're going to come back to that. that <laughs> but that's the first thing we see in, the, in this passage. The path of Cain is marked by self-righteousness. Hold on to that. We're going to come back. I told you you need a seatbelt. Second thing, the path of Cain is marked by conflict in this world. Look at verse 6. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. That's the story. You thought your family was bad. Cain gets angry. God tries to calm him down. Cain doesn't listen. And we have the first murder in the Bible. He kills his butt. Now, I want you to notice here, this is what's important. I want you to notice what God says to him as he gets angry. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Gordon Wenham, an expert theologian on Genesis, says you can translate this, this as, if you do what is right, is there not forgiveness? The, p- the point is the language, whichever way you want to translate it, is the, is the language of acceptance from God. God is saying, Cain, if you do the right thing, if you do what your brother did, if you trust me, I will accept you. I will forgive you. Turn back. Do the right thing. It's God offering his hand. This is even before he murders. In his anger, he sees where he's going. And therefore, he says, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Folks, that little chunk, that passage, that little, that little thing I just read, that is, it's heavy. You know, I was listening to Paul Tripp. Some of you will know him. Uh, he's an American pastor. And, and he, he came out to South Africa, and he tells of a safari he went on. And he tells of they were tracking a pride of lions that were uh, chasing down a kudu. And he tells the story, and he says, we follow, he says that we followed this thing, and, and, and the, the poor kudu, the lions just chased it and chased it, and they ran it till, it till it was completely exhausted. And then he says the lions did the strange thing. They stopped, and they backed off, and they crouched, and they waited. And he says you could see the kudu just relaxed. But it was out of danger. And it was at that point that the lions nailed the kudu. Folks, that is what God is describing here. If you ignore God, if you ignore His call, if you remain self-righteous, you're the center of this world, not God. Sin will be crouching at your door ready to pounce on you. It will grab you, and then it will be too late. And suddenly before you know it, Abel is dead. Welcome to our world. Folks, that, according to the Bible, is where conflict arises from. It arises from sin in you, and it crouches, and it wants you. See, folks, the problem of self-righteousness, the problem of my way, not God's way, is that we think we know better. That is the heart of self-righteousness. It is the heart of sin. The Jewish people think they are right. The Palestinian people think they are right. The husband thinks he's right. The wife thinks he's right. Everybody thinks they are right. (laughs) You see, (laughs) if you disagree, it makes you angry. If someone is better than you, you get jealous. If someone has more than you, you covet. If someone is, is liked more than you, you hate. And sin is crouching there. And what happens? It pounces on you. Anger turns to violence as the crouching tiger devours you. Jealousy to spiteful vengeance as you dream up ways of pulling other people down. 
Coveting can turn to stealing. Hate turns to murder. And so sin takes hold of a person, and the world is a world of conflict. You see, folks, the crouching tiger is the hidden dragon. See what it did there? It's hidden inside you. You carry it around with you. We are little conflict-creating monsters. We just need to be poked. <laughs> and the door will swing over and sin will pour out. He should see, you know how it is? How can they? Just poked. How can you say I'm not like, and you didn't, and you think you, and he's paid more than me? Just poke, and you'll see what happens. Genesis 4 explains our world. The path of Cain is marked by conflict in the world. Hold on to that thought. We're going to come back to it. Third thing, the path of Cain is marked by the condemnation of God. Have a look at verse 9. I love this bit. Well, I don't love it, but it's interesting. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Now, God hasn't lost Abel. God knows exactly where Abel's gone, just like in Genesis I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Actually, let me say that again. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? That's more like it. You can hear him dig his heels in, can't you? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you're under curse and driven from the ground, which, is mouth to, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work, the ground will no longer heal its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. It's fascinating that, don't you, don't you think? Cain kills his brother, and then he denies it before God. Aren't, aren't we like that? You know, I often use this illustration, and I don't mean to embarrass my marriage, but like I'll, I'll have a little Barney with my wife. We all, you know, these things happen, conflict, self-righteousness, here it is. Um, and halfway through the argument, I realize my wife is right, and I'll keep arguing. <laughs> don't laugh, you do it too. <laughs> that's how deep sin is, and that's how stubborn we get. That is Cain. I don't know where my brother is. I'm my brother, my, my brother, keep it. <laughs> But God says Abel's blood cries out from the ground. It's the language of justice. You see, folks, Abel's gone. And Cain thinks he's got away with it. Even the blood has sunk into the ground, so he can't see it anymore. But God sees it. He sees every single sin, and he holds every sin accountable. And so he pulls Cain aside, and Cain comes under the condemnation of God, righteous justice. He is sentenced to be a restless wanderer. No peace in his heart. His work will be hard. He'll be driven from the presence of God. He will live in fear of death as he wanders the world as a restless, alienated from God person. Recognize that? Genesis 3. It's exactly the condemnation Adam and Eve come under. Folks, is that not the world we live in? Restless people fearing death, outside of the presence of God, living in a world marked by sin and conflict. Folks, our world, as Romans 1 clearly puts it, is living under the judgment of God, and that's because our world follows the way of Cain. And one day, this world will stand before God, and God will ask again, verse 10, what have you done? There is a call for justice, and one day God will hold this world accountable for the way they have lived in self-righteousness, ignoring God to have the self as the center of the universe. The path of Cain is marked by self-righteousness. The path of Cain is marked by conflict in the world. The, pain, the path of Cain is marked by the condemnation of God. Do you hear the beach calling? the burg, the garage, the braai. Do you feel the desire to run from this reality? 
I do. Do you want to block the sermon out of your brain because it's just too overwhelming? I do. But before we run, listen to Abel. It's the last point. The path of Abel leads to Christ. Put your thinking cap on just for one moment. You might remember Eve in the garden was promised that she would give birth to the serpent crusher, one who would crush Satan's head, the devil, and save humanity, if you like, the one who would finally deal with sin crouching at our door. It's the reason, actually, if if you're following text closely, it's actually the reason that Eve gets so excited about the birth of Cain. I've achieved, I've given, she says she's given birth to a man, which is unusual language in the the Hebrew, you would say you've given birth to a baby, you know. She's excited because she thinks that Cain is going to be this destroyer of evil. Yay, the promise. And Cain becomes the destroyer of nothing but his brother. Interesting. So we better have another kid. And they have Abel. And he has faith. This is the one. This is the one, finally. And what happens? Abel doesn't say anything. He just dies. You know what Abel's name means in Hebrew? Vapor. Mist. Looks like hope is just gone. He dies, and there's no one to rescue. And so you ask yourself, if this is a storyline of the Bible now. We just deterred for, we just went side for a minute. And so you ask yourself, is there any hope for humanity? Verse 25 gives us a little bit of hope. We didn't read it, but have a look at this. Adam made love to his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. Seth also had a son, excuse me, Seth also had a son and named him Enosh. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Here's your thinking cap for a moment. In the Bible, there are two lines running through the whole Bible. Can you believe it? 40 different authors over thousands of different years, and yet there's there's these lines that run through the Bible. There's the line of Abel, which seems to be the faithful line. Those are calling the name of the Lord. And as you read, there's the line of Cain, which is the unfaithful line that ends up being the Canaanites and ends up being the Babylonians, which represent the world. And the line of Abel, Seth, Enosh, the line of faith. And the line of faith leads us to a man of faith who we read is also innocent, like Abel was, and was slain like Abel was, also by self-righteous people who also in their anger killed him. Except his blood did not cry out for justice. His blood cried out for forgiveness. Have a look at this from Hebrews 12. But you have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You see, folks, in one sense, if you're feeling bruised, we're all like Cain. We all have the stain of sin on us. We all have blood on our hands like Cain. We all sit under the condemnation of God as we turn from Him to live our own lives. It's my life, God. You know, I'm going to do my own thing. But if we have faith like Abel, if we trust this Jesus, then the right thing to do is to trust Him and find forgiveness. And that's because the justice and the condemnation that we deserve fall upon Jesus in our place. You see, in love, Jesus has shed His blood for us. Instead of it crying justice, it cries, Father, forgive them. And so, Romans 8, as you'll know, it says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we know this. We hear it in church all the time. But you need to keep listening to the message, because what it is saying in this is that all the condemnation, all the anger of God for your wickedness, for my wickedness, for the world's wickedness, for our self-righteousness has been poured out on Jesus and not us. Jesus sheds His blood and His blood cries, no condemnation, no condemnation, no condemnation. The long-awaited promise of Eve is found in Jesus. The path of Abel leads to Christ. 
And if we will be like Abel and trust Jesus in our brokenness, in our self-righteousness, actually, we will find a hope for real forgiveness. Now, we could just stop there. We've looked at the Bible. We've wrestled with Cain, 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 and Abel. But what do we do with all of this? Well, I want to end with three don'ts. We always end with three do's. We're going to end with three don'ts today. Here's three don'ts. Don't be fooled by religiousness. You might just be a cane. Folks, hard to say this stuff. We need to hear it. God is not impressed when we tick the religious boxes so that we can get on with our self-righteous lives. I'm going to say that again. God is not impressed when we tick the religious boxes so that we can get on with our self-righteous lives. He's not impressed with our giving. He's not impressed with our church going, with our signing up to serve. He's not impressed with our food parcels, your good deeds, your care for your children. He is not impressed that you treat him like a monkey on your back. And you do a whole lot of stuff to get him out of the way so that you can get on with what you really want to get on with. He is not impressed with self-righteousness. That was Cain. So today might be a good day to ask yourself, where is your heart? Do you honor God with your lips? Do all the right things? But your heart is far from God. If that is you, you need to think about that because Cain was not accepted by God and neither will you be. Don't be fooled by religiousness. You might just be a Cain. Don't justify the crouching tiger. That's the second thing. One theologian said it like this, which I think is helpful. Listen to this. As long as you look at workholism as conscientiousness, as long as you look at your grudge as moral outrage, as, your, as long as you look at materialism as ambition or arrogance as healthy self-assertion, as long as you look at your obsession with looks as good grooming, you're vulnerable, you're in denial, you're self-righteous, and sin is crouching at your door. Folks, it's so easy, and this is, I'm talking, I, I, I'm, there's a mirror here. It's so easy to justify your sin. It's so easy to justify your envy for someone else. It's so easy to talk about someone in a way that sounds like okay to talk like that, and meanwhile your heart is just pulling them down. You hate them. You hate what they've got. You hate everything. It's easy to let cr the crouching tiger in. It's easy to say, I can't fight sin. This is just the world we live in. Folks, we need to stop justifying the crouching tiger. If you are someone who has faith in Jesus, he has given you the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, put to death the misdeeds of the body. In other words, fight. Folks, it might be that today is the day you want to start fighting. You have Jesus with you and in you by his Holy Spirit, giving you the power to say no and to start fighting. If you don't, sin is crouching at your door and it'll have you. You might be okay now, but it will have you. You know, I have a lot of people come through my door with marriage issues, kid issues, all these different issues, and they usually come to me when it's, when it's bad. <laughs> That's okay. I'm here. But you know what you hear all the time? You hear this. We don't know how we got here. I would have never thought that this would happen to us. And you know how it is? We, we look at somebody and their marriage has been destroyed, and you go, like, how did that happen? They just seem like such nice people. And we think it'll never happen to us. And as long as you are saying that and not fighting, sin is crouching at your door and it will have you. Don't justify the crouching tiger. 
But, and lastly, don't miss the grace of God. Folks, did you notice throughout the story and Genesis 3 that there stands God? He is gracious and kind. Where is your brother? Do what is right. Those are all calls of a gracious God going, there, I mean, just think about it for a moment. Cain is spitting the dummy. Why, why are you, you like Abel more than me? He spits the dummy and God comes and goes, I love you, come. He holds out his gracious hand. And then even when he murders, you would expect God just to kick him into touch. But he doesn't. Where is your brother? What have you done? It's an offer of grace. Throughout the Old Testament, God always holds out his hand of grace. He's the God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, fifth chances, six chances. He's the God of grace. He calls us back. And that is because we are the pinnacle of his creation and he loves us. Don't miss that. Don't miss the gracious God who plans the whole of history and ensures that there is a faithful line that ends in Jesus who spills his blood for you and me. Don't miss that. Why not get off the path of Cain this morning? Remember there's two paths. Which one are you on? You might be on Cain's path. Get on the path of Cain and onto the path of Abel this morning by simply turning your back on Cain and trusting Jesus who forgives you for every Cain moment you have ever had and are having at the moment. I know there are some of you who are sitting in this room who feel worthless. You think, as you hear about Cain, you go, that's me. That might be the Holy Spirit convicting you. That is me. And you know what? It probably is you. <laughs> you probably are so broken and so sinful. And yet this gracious God holds out his hand to you and says, I'll have you. I'll forgive you, I'll make you right, I'll spill my blood for you. If you're someone who beats yourself up because of sin, if you feel acutely like Cain, look again at Jesus' blood, who speaks a better word than Abel. Don't forget the grace of God. Don't forget that your God loves you. Let's pray. Father God, there's always much more to say, but you have always said exactly what you want us to hear. And so we thank you for this passage as bruising it is to see the reality of this world. Why can't we get along, Father? It's because of our sin. We are sorry, and we ask that you would take us from Cain and make us Abel's who trust you in our brokenness and in our self-righteousness. Would you change us? Would you help us? to be your people now in this world, making a difference for the glory of your name. We ask that you'd forgive us and change us. Father, I pray particularly for those who beat themselves up. Would you come and meet them and comfort them and would you hold them in your arms, showing them your forgiveness and your comfort. Father, for those of us who are arrogant and self-centered and self-righteous, who think we're okay and we can get on with our lives and it doesn't matter, would you rebuke us? Would you rebuke us, but then bring us back? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.